From endless crop fields to fertile tide pools, from lively streams and creeks to teeming wetlands, from granite cliffs and rugged shorelines to long sandy beaches and untamed surf, from sunlit kelp forests to thriving seafloor and midnight canyon depths. This is your sanctuary. Hi, I'm Paul Michel, superintendent of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and your host. From rugged rocky shores and lush kelp forests to one of the largest underwater canyons and the only protected seamount in all of North America, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is one of the most diverse and dynamic marine ecosystems in the world. And it's right here in our own backyard. This special place also has some of the most spectacular coastal scenery, including sandy beaches and dunes to rolling hills and steep mountains. But there's also a human dimension to the sanctuary with approximately 3 million people living within 50 miles of the shore, many who rely on the sanctuary for recreation or work. With its great beauty, diversity of habitats and life, and the vibrant towns along its shore, the sanctuary is a national focus for recreation, research, and education. The Your Sanctuary TV show is about connecting people with National Marine Sanctuaries. There is so much to share with you about what sanctuaries are, their value to coastal communities, the fantastic animals and habitats, the many commercial and recreational uses, the amazing science and research occurring right here, and how we are all connected to the ocean through our activities and the watersheds in which we live. We will be showcasing marine life and science, ocean uses and conservation, coastal communities and the businesses dependent on a healthy ocean, as well as the many fascinating organizations and people involved in all these aspects of our ocean relationship. This is your sanctuary. Come on, jump in. Here's Congressman Sam Farr with a quick history of how the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary moved from a dream to a reality. I've been asked, how did we create the National Marine Sanctuary? How did it all get started? And I have to say that it, it all got started because of wonderful people living around uh, the Monterey Bay area. In the 1970s, late 70s, uh, the federal government was under a lot of pressure to start developing more energy resources because we had a national energy crisis. And the thought was, let's start drilling in the California coastline where we'd never drilled before. We knew we had dr oil wells and, and, and issues with oil wells in the Santa Barbara Channel. And I think nobody really thought that there was oil up here in the ocean. We knew we had some oil in southern Monterey County, but uh, when the oil companies showed large interest in developing uh, oil rigs off particularly the Santa Cruz coastline, right near the Año Nuevo uh, breeding grounds for the elephant seal, uh, that's when uh, they woke up this area. And we just said, you can't do that, and realized we didn't have much power. Uh, we, we, we did petitions uh, to stop it. Uh, we had a, President Carter was, uh, had a gr good Secretary of Interior, Cecil Andrews, he came here. We had protests for him, we had support for him, we did everything. And he came, went back and removed the Northern California tracks from uh, lease sales. So we were off the hook for a moment. 
But then Ronald Reagan got elected president of the United States and he appointed a guy named James Watt who said, I'm for oil drilling everywhere and we're, we're no deals, we're taking everything that's been uh, put off limits and putting them on the table. We're going to go out to another bid process. The oil companies were getting very excited because the price of oil at that time was high, not as high as it is now, but it was high. And um, boy, we had Liam Panetta in Congress and we were trying to figure out what are we going to do? We, we can't control this. We don't have the President of the United States in our favor or uh, certainly the Secretary of Interior. The one thing that we did have was that Ronald Reagan was a president from California, He'd been governor of the state of California, raised in California, lived in California. So we used the California influence on the president to really pressure him uh, to not drill off our coast. And it was kind of a, a holding action. Uh, at that same time, uh, the national, uh, the aquarium opened, and David Packard, who'd been in the Nixon administration, put a lot of pressure on the administration, on the Reagan administration, to be interested in not uh, sort of doing things that might hurt the water quality, because the aquarium uses fresh water out of the out of the ocean. It was, the, I think, the only aquarium at the time that used natural seawater instead of making their own salt water. So we had a lot of private interests and, and, high, and a lot of people in important places. And again, we initiated this concept of creating a national marine sanctuary. Uh, by the time uh, everything kind of, we, we put a stop on it again, and, but then uh, George Bush one was elected. And he was coming up for his reelection and this California issue on oil drilling was on the table. And fortunately, Pete Wilson, who had been the Republican senator from California, went to uh, George Bush and he said, you know, you've got to play the environmental card. You've got to have something. He said, why don't you save the California coastline, particularly there in the central part of California? Uh, it isn't really worth all the money it's, it's going to cost to do it. Uh, there's no onshore support facilities. And Leon Panetta has this proposal to create a national marine sanctuary. Congress had approved the authorization, but had not because it wasn't the Congress to decide the boundaries. So this is where this whole uh, issue on boundaries went. And the federal government proposed in a, in a regulatory hearing process, essentially a small size sanctuary, which was sort of just inside Monterey Bay, a medium sized uh, sanctuary that still I think had the oil wells, part of the oil fields uh, in it, but half of them out, and then a really big one. And sort of the political advice was, look it, uh, you'll never get the, with the little one we can argue against. The middle one, which probably we have to all come to agreement that that's the one we can get politically. And the big one's probably politically impossible with this administration. But a couple of things happened. President Bush ran an ad showing the Big Sur coastline as something that he was interested in saving. And so we parlayed the politics of all of this into if you're really going to save the coast, then the only way to do it is to do what we call the whole enchilada, the big National Marine Sanctuary. And Senator Wilson uh, went to Ronald Reagan and says, you ought to do that. Uh, it'll, I mean to George Bush, excuse me, to George Bush, and said, you ought to do the big one, what we call the whole enchilada. The NOAA services came out to have their public required hearings on this, and what they call the rulemaking process. And I think we set national records because anybody who wanted to testify could sign up. We had over 700 people sign up to testify in here, in a hearing in Monterey, and a hearing in Santa Cruz. Those hearings went all day and all night, and all day and all night. I don't think they'd ever had that kind of a hearing process before. And it was overwhelmingly in favor of the big uh, boundary line. And from that, what you saw is that when it was designated to be the National Marine Sanctuary with the big boundary line, it was felt like we did it. We owned it. This wasn't something where the federal government came and asked us if we wanted a sanctuary. We went to the federal government and demanded that they protect our uh, shoreline. It's the only sanctuary in the entire system that it specifically prohibits offshore oil drilling inside the sanctuary. So we're more protected than any other sanctuary in the United States. But what the history of it, and it's the best history, and it's the history that makes democracy in America so, so wonderful and powerful, is it was done by the people. The rest of our program looks at the sanctuary from four different perspectives, shoreline, intertidal, surface, and underwater. We'll show you some of the activities, sites, and science that takes place in these areas. Our first area is the shoreline. A lot of people relate a shoreline to the beaches, the sand, the surf, 
the waves breaking. The Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary shoreline has this and much, much more. It's been an inspiration for science and commerce for generations. It was the beauty of the shoreline that inspired the creation of one of the most famous golf courses in the world, Pebble Beach. gorgeous backdrop of Monterey Bay has spawned a huge tourist industry, making hospitality the number one economic engine of the Monterey Peninsula. And here's some words of wisdom from a man who is an economic engine himself. A, a lot of people have asked me over the years, especially here on Cannery Row, what type of sea mammal do you relate to the most? Well, as you can see, I have most in common with a whale of my size, maybe since I lost a little weight, a baby whale. In business, once in a while, maybe I've been related to a shark. In romance with my wife over the years, maybe an octopus. And then finally, the thing I admire most being in the restaurant business, can you imagine being a sea otter, laying in this beautiful sanctuary, eating abalone all day at $100 a pound? Perhaps I'm a little bit of everything. When I was born and lived back east, going to the beach was the highlight of our vacations. Swimming, water skiing, every water spot you can imagine. We've always loved it. The ocean has been a part of something positive throughout my whole life. My adult life, working on the ocean, living overlooking the ocean, and having accessibility to the ocean, has been a great treat for me. And I hope someday for the rest of the 300 million people plus in America, they will have that same love and passion. You know, I, I didn't say this, I think Jefferson, the poet said it, the Monterey Peninsula is the most beautiful place on earth where land meets water. Well, I agree with him. It's hard to think of beaches on the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary without thinking of Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz Beach features familiar sights such as the boardwalk, families enjoying the surf and sand, and of course, those who are happy just enjoying the warmth of the sun. Some of the things that our company has done to help the stewardship of the bay is that we recycle all our uh, materials, everything we can. We uh, clean the beach, and we also have done away with styrofoam uh, many years ago. And these things have all attributed to the health of our bay. What really inspires me about the ocean is its pure beauty, its gigantic size, and how <clears throat> it connects all the people in the world. And it's important for us to know that we all affect the ocean in one way or another. On the northern edge of Santa Cruz is one of the few privately funded research institutes in the area, Long Marine Labs. So I think I've always been inspired by the ocean, and in one reason, uh, I think it's been said that, uh, I've said that I'd rather wake up in the middle of nowhere than in any city on earth, and that nowhere is often uh, beside the ocean, and somehow standing here looking out, knowing there's 10,000 miles of water between Japan and, and myself, gives me some inspiration, gives me some sort of peace of mind. There's some, there's some open space, there's some quiet, there's some solitude, there's something left out there. So it's, it's both an edge in some ways, but it's also a frontier. Our next area of exploration is the intertidal zone. The intertidal zone generally refers to the area that is above water at low tide and underwater at high tide. This area is home to many different types of animals and plants, such as starfish, sea urchins, and even some species of coral. 
Well, I first discovered my passion for the ocean when I was probably about 20 years old. And I was taking a course in college at UC Santa Cruz, and it was a field biology course. And we went out for low tides to um, discover and, and collect marine algae. And this is when I really just got so excited about the ocean because, you know, you see it from the surface and it looks interesting. Maybe some animals will reveal themselves from time to time, but when the tide goes out and the tide pools are revealed, it's like a whole nother world. And um, I just fell in love with all of that and later uh, studied marine ecology of marine plants, which is a fascinating little known area that a lot of people don't think about, but um, it was really tide pool life and the, uh, the tide pools of the, the northern uh, California coast that got me excited about the ocean. My favorite place in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary would probably be the Big Sur Coast. I've spent a lot of time there and really, I mean, the Big Sur Coast, poets, authors, artists have been inspired by it. It's just such a remarkable meeting of land and sea, as, as is often tritely stated, but from an ocean perspective, it's just, it's so wild, it's so rich. The ocean there is just uh, it's just a wonderland and it's very untouched. That's the wonderful thing about it. And so it's really a great place to go and be inspired about, you know, what the ocean should look like if things are, are well and if, if there's not a lot of human activity and human perturbation there. And so for that, uh, I'm, I'm always inspired by the Big Sur Coast and, and I'm really glad that it's received some extra protection with some of the state efforts over the past few years on, on top of the sanctuary efforts. When I think about the question of if I could be any sea creature for a day, what would I be? I have to say my answer is I wouldn't want to be any of the creatures in the ocean. Perhaps it's my science background and knowing too much about it. But the fact of the matter is life in the ocean is really harsh. You've got predators going after you. It's freezing cold. If you're a sea otter, you've got to spend all your time looking for food and keeping your fur clean. and, and keeping warm and you know I, I would just say you know the human condition we might we might think it's a sorry state but actually we have it pretty darn good. Time once again for our sea creature call-in. Let's see who we have on the line. Hello this is Superintendent Paul Michelle. Hey chill out dude I'm on the phone. Oh yeah like this is dolphin dude or you could call me awesomest dolphin is my Latin tag. Uh, anyway, I was hoping to be like the hundredth caller and win a surfboard or something. Well, dude, thanks for calling, but it's not that kind of call in. This is actually to hear your questions or comments from the ocean. Oh, Baller, man. Okay, well, I got a question. It's like always on my mind. Like, when's the next rip and surf coming in? And how about ponying up some sardines and anchovy too? Best thing to do is check out the NOAA weather buoys online at www.ndbc.noaa.gov. And as for the fish, man, you would know better than me. Besides, sanctuaries don't regulate fishing. Dude, man, my laptop didn't work in the water. Guess I'll have to keep checking in with my buds on your research bin. They got some cool equipment on board. So you're a surfer, are you? <laughs> hey, dude, this guy's a riot! Of course, man, the bigger the better, like tubular barrels, hanging flips and flicks. Awesome. Okay, like you got my surfing blood pumping, man. I gotta go. Cool talking to you, superintendent. Keep up the good work and hey, do something about those pesky sea lions getting on my waves, will ya? All right, dolphin dude. I don't think I can do much about the surfing sea lions. Thanks for calling. Wow, that was interesting. If you have a favorite sea creature you would like to hear from, email us at seacall at ampmedia.org. We're going to move from the intertidal zone to one of the most active areas of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the surface. The sea surface, whether near shore or offshore, is teeming with wildlife and bustling with human activity. Sooty shearwaters travel thousands of miles to and from South America to the sanctuary each year. The black albatross rides the wind currents back and forth across the Pacific Ocean from Asia to California's central coast. The black-footed albatross travels from its nesting grounds in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands all the way to California's coastline to gather food for its single chick. 
This 6,200 mile round trip may take up to a week. The kelp beds in the sanctuary provide a critical area for wildlife feeding and refuge. You'll often see egrets, and one of the sanctuary's most popular animals, the sea otter. Sea lions often congregate at the surface around jetties and wharves where they almost seem to enjoy entertaining their human audience. One of the few times people get a glimpse of the grandeur and majesty of the sanctuary's largest mammals is during a whale watching cruise. You might see gray whales, blue whales, humpback whales, and even killer whales or orcas. In addition, there are dolphins, porpoises, and many more animal residents and visitors to the sanctuary's rich habitats. I first got excited about the Pacific Ocean when my family came over here to visit from the San Joaquin Valley. I was born in Sacramento and raised in San Jose, and we used to come over here when I was a little kid. We had a great time every time we came to the beach and to the ocean. Uh, really fell in love with it. I think that it was uh, not only to escape the heat, but to see the real difference between growing up in a valley and uh, learning about the ocean, getting to see not only the ocean itself, but uh, and body surfing and hanging around on the beach, but really getting in touch with the sea life and the abundance of the ocean at the time. That would have been back in the 1950s and 60s, and the ocean really was a very different place then. You don't have personal connection to the ocean like so many people do who live along the coast and my particular connection to the ocean has a couple of pieces. One is I serve on the California Ocean Science Trust so I have kind of a policy interest in the ocean but the more personal part is really being able to go out on the ocean the last 30 years with my friend Steve Reed who has a wonderful 36-foot scepter sailboat and we go out and have a great time. He's the captain, I'm the crew. But getting out on the ocean, and being able to be out there for a couple hours at a time and get a little further off the coast and be able to see the abundance of sea life, seeing spinner dolphins, being able to see whales, being able to see the seabirds that oftentimes live their entire life out at sea. Uh, that connection is really personal and wonderful. I think when you spend time around the ocean and sometimes in the ocean, maybe develop a little bit of a fantasy. Gee, I wonder if I could be a sea creature for a day, what that might be like. And for me, when I go out there, that fantasy gets reinforced every time I see a spinner dolphin. The ones that come out, out of the ocean and they actually literally spin and go back in. And that just looks like they are having so much fun. They're probably running away from a predator, I imagine, but it looks so joyful and fun and exhilarating that uh, my fantasy is to be a spinner dolphin for a day. Whale watching is one way to enjoy the sanctuary. Other activities include kayaking, long boating, the solitude of paddle boarding, the thrill of surfing and sailing and the enjoyment of all types of pleasure craft. 12 miles offshore, shipping lanes comprise a big part of the sanctuary's commerce. 200 ton container ships move up and down the coast 24 hours a day, delivering goods between the ports of San Francisco, Oakland and Los Angeles, Long Beach. Another sanctuary surface activity combines sailing and learning. Organizations such as the O'Neill Sea Odyssey teach students about the ocean while holding class on board a sailing ship. I grew up near the ocean, near Seal Beach, California, so I spent equal amounts of time at the beach in Southern California and in the mountains, mostly the San Gabriel Mountains and San Gregonio area in Southern California. So I learned a little bit about watersheds and the ocean at an early age. O'Neill Sea Odyssey takes about 5,000 mostly low-income kids out onto the ocean each year. These are kids from schools from an area generally from Oakland down to King City and some of the inland areas around that uh, region. What we do is we teach the kids about marine science, mostly plankton, 
about watersheds, and about a sense of place and mathematics through navigation. It's a free program and each school that participates undertakes a community service project. But most importantly, we teach kids who wouldn't have the opportunity otherwise about the ocean and about the need to protect the ocean. And we do that through science, hands-on learning. I think I would be a sea anemone, uh, mostly because when I grew up, I grew up around tide pools and spent a lot of time around sea anemones and noticed how they absorb things around them and how they attune to their environment and they were part of the transition phase between the sandy beach and the near shore habitat. They're part of the tide pool environment and we're part of that transition and I think I would enjoy doing that. If I were to wave a magic wand over the Monterey Bay Sanctuary or over the ocean in general, I would transport us back about 100 years in which you have a lot more wildlife, you have a lot more bird life, uh, you have richer habitats uh, within Monterey Bay and beyond in the ocean and then humankind will understand this as it develops its economy as it must but do it in a way that takes into account the ocean resources that are right in our backyard. As Michael Corleone said, yes. keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Recreational fishing is a favorite pastime on the sanctuary. Well, the sanctuary means for me it's a place to hang out with my buds and go fishing and just enjoy the weather out here and just enjoy the peninsula and this beautiful coast. Oh, I'd definitely be a sea otter just out there playing in the waves, enjoying my life. Your sanctuary. Your sanctuary. Your sanctuary. Commercial fishing also takes place in sanctuary waters. My name's David Crabb and out beyond the harbor here is the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. It's also where I've commercially fished for many years. Fishing's important to the harbor, Monterey, and California. I've mostly fished for squid, but in this harbor you'll see a lot of other fish like anchovies, sardines, halibut, salmon, Dungeness crab, just to name a few. I hope you tune into your sanctuary and see the abundance and diversity of wildlife and the many sustainable uses of this marine ecosystem. See you at the docks or at the seafood counter. Every week we're going to feature a special call-in from our research vessel Fulmar based right here in Monterey. Well, I think I have a call coming in right now. Hello, this is Paul Michelle, Superintendent. Hey, yo, can I call you uh, Super Polly for short? Uh, sure, well, who is this and where are you calling from? This is Joey Fellucci, Brooklyn Harbor Seal, dialing in from Monterey Bay. Well, I never heard of uh, Brooklyn Harbor Seal. Yeah, well, I never heard of a super poly, but that's neither hither nor thither. Here's the thing. I migrated all the way here from Brooklyn after the river caught fire. Oh, wait, and, uh, you swam here all the way from New York? I, no, I, I flew business class on Southwest. Uh, anyway, I got two things I want to say. Go ahead, Joey. A voice off. I love the program. The guys from the former hung a monitor over the side and we're catching the internet stream. Second, thanks for working to keep the sanctuary clean and pristine for future harbor seals. Third, my friend Tortuga the Toidle. Toidle? Yeah, Toidle, you know, four flippers and a shell. Oh, turtle, okay. What's up with Tortuga? Well, I don't know if it's his uh, total eyesight or old age, but he can't differentiate between a plastic bag and a jellyfish. Can you do anything about that? Well, Joey, we do have programs in place to help try to keep our beaches and nearshore areas clean. Hey, that's great, Super Polly. Oh, I gotta go. Tortuga's chasing another plastic bag. Oh. See ya. Okay, well, good luck. Uh, well, that's it for this week's call-in. If you have a favorite sea creature you'd like to hear from on the show, please send us a line at seacall at antmedia.org. Measuring 100 feet in length, blue whales are the largest animal known to inhabit the earth. During the summer months, they feed on large swarms of krill. An adult blue whale can consume up to 8,000 pounds of these tiny shrimp-like animals in a single day. We'll now explore beneath the surface of the sanctuary. How do we get there? One way is scuba diving.
Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute specializes in unmanned deep water exploration. My passion for the ocean began watching Jacques Cousteau. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and there's not a lot of ocean there, but we did have a river which connected to the ocean, and I was fascinated by how the earth, the land, the sea connected, and it was really Jacques Cousteau who turned me on to that. And, and I would stay up late at night waiting for National Geographic programming, and, uh, and it's really there that I got my inspiration to be an oceanographer. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute is a basic research organization. We combine science and engineering to develop tools for studying the ocean. And so our, our role in conservation really begins at that fundamental level of how does the ocean work? How is it changing due to natural and uh, human perturbed circumstances? And how might we better inform policymakers as to the trajectory of the ocean and how we might better uh, care for it in the future? Well, my personal connection with the ocean starts with sailing a small boat along the California coastline and foolishly without an autopilot and only my wife and I who was unskilled in the ways of sailing. And our trip down the coast to the Channel Islands proved to be quite an eye-opening experience both to the vastness of the Pacific Ocean and also its beauty and it's really I think there that I found my love and passion for the ocean. I think one of the most inspiring things about the ocean is to remember that it's like the heart and lungs of our planet. The oceans taking in and out of all the essential nutrients and gases. It's something that I think most of us just don't think about what a service the ocean does for the entire Earth. And it doesn't matter where you are on this planet, you owe your life to the ocean. Well, I think my favorite place is along the Big Sur coast, looking down at the ocean. It is a place where the land meets the sea in a most dramatic way. And it is such a rich environment, both geologically, uh, for the riches of marine life, and, uh, and culturally. It's a phenomenal place to see it all. Rising out of the sanctuary depths is the Davidson Seamount. I'm Dr. Andrew DeVogelaire with the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Come join me on an exciting expedition to the Davidson Seamount. Just 93 miles west of this visitor center, there's a huge undersea mountain. It's in dark, cold water, but it's teeming with exotic sea life. Davidson Seamount is 26 miles long and 8 miles wide. Its base is nearly 12,000 feet deep, and its peak is over 4,000 feet below the ocean surface. It last erupted 9.8 million years ago, and now provides habitat for diverse, spectacular species, like these fishes, anemones, Tunicates, and sponges. Many species are bigger and slow growing in the deep sea. These sponges are two feet tall and are living space for even more species. Deep sea corals can grow eight feet tall, and some are hundreds of years old, fragile, and in need of protection. We found new species that have yet to be named, like this mystery moss. As we complete our dive to Davidson Seamount, we realize that it's a new frontier for discovery and inspires us with a sense of wonder for the Earth. In April of 2011, seven Polynesian vessels, or Vaca Moanas, set sail from New Zealand, headed across the Pacific to the shores of California. Using celestial navigation and the power of the wind, these catamarans were following the wake of the world's first seafarers, from thousands of years ago. The purpose of their journey is to share with the world the Polynesian people's respect for and relationship with the ocean and how strongly this has been incorporated into their culture. 
In August, the Vacas arrived at Del Monte Beach in Monterey, greeted by a tribal representative of the Esalen American Indians, another people who honored and respected Mother Ocean and lived harmoniously with her resources. Both of these cultures have celebrated the ocean and its gifts through protection and preservation for thousands of years. Your sanctuary carries this message to you and asks you to join us in treating our ocean as a vital resource deserving of our attention and care. If I could wave a magic wand across this sanctuary and make one change, my wish would be that I could take out all of the trash that has ended up in that sanctuary. Whether that's from trash being left on the beach that gets blown into the ocean, or trash that goes down the storm drain that ends up in the river that flows to the ocean, or whether it's something that might have fallen off or blown off a boat. If I could take all that trash, get it out of the ocean to protect the marine life, that would be my wish. <laughs> Hey, 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 hey,